Thank you, Brother Caleb, for leading us in worship, you, you and your wife, so I understand, and also our brother for setting up the PA system. It is good to see all of you, to be back here in my home church uh, where I grew up, or my mother church where I grew up, and I worship together with everyone. This afternoon, I have chosen this topic, serving together in partnership, having in mind that this weekend is supposed to be vaccinated, see not Saturday or see not Sunday. And so in thinking about the synod uh, in Singapore, the Presbyterian Church in Singapore and a large synod comprising of the synod and two presbyteries, I thought of this topic to share together with you. And as we have read from Scripture earlier, 1 Corinthians 12, it tells us significant teaching uh, about how to live together as a body of Christ. So I invite you to ponder with me on this topic as we consider this text together this afternoon. Let us pause for prayer. <clears throat> Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that you inspired and space that you have given to us. In a world where there's so much trouble, you have preserved this space for us to worship in security and safety. And uh, you have given us the freedom to express our faith in you. Therefore, this afternoon, we ask for your Holy Spirit's leading and guidance to illumine our minds and to guide our hearts, transforming it into what you desire it to be. So, Lord, in this time, preserve it for us, that we may hear you and follow after you. We pray this in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hello, eyes. Can't you see where you are going? Says the brain. That is the brain, if the brain can talk to the eyes. I can see, but the feet insist on going in that direction, replies the eyes to the brain. That is, if the eyes can speak. And mouth, why can't you tell the feet not to go that way? Says the brain to the mouth. But you said, I speak before I think, and so you shut me down last week. I can't say anything now, retorted the mouth to the brain. Yes, you must do something, says the brain to the ears. Huh? What did you say? <laughs> you shut me down last week too, says the ears to the brain. And signal the feet not to go in that direction. Towards the cliff, the brain says to the hands. I did, but the feet won't listen to me. I mean the feet can't hear, only know how to hear. You all so stupid, shouted the brain. I'll take over from here. Here comes brain number two, speaking to brain number one. Hello, brain. How are you? Hello, brain. I ask, how are you? All is quiet. Brain cannot speak. Brain, hello, brain. Are you there? Now pretend the brain can speak. Brain one, hello, brain. Brain two, what happened? Why did it take so long? For you to respond to me, brain one, I, they are all so brainless. The feet insists on going his own direction, saying it knows the way best, but it was heading for the cliff. I quickly asked the mouth to warn the feet, but the mouth kept singing, I mean, kept eating, saying it was made to eat food. Not one foot. 
Then I signal to the eyes to open wide so that the feet can see the cliff. But the eyes told me they are on spiritual retreat. Eyes closed. And what about the hands? I asked the hands to stop the feet. I tried. The hands keep waving, but the feet keep walking. The feet insist that they know where they are going. Brain too. Jia la la. Jiao san zi ni mue. Be brain one. I shut them all down. They don't think before they act. They don't know how to think. I'll do all the thinking. Brain two. Who then will do all the acting? You see, this is somewhat reflective of the Corinthian spiritual problem. They didn't know how to express themselves collectively as a body of Christ. Instead, each one was seeking to outdo the other, or each one was insisting to do so as they know how, according to what they know, what, not what they collectively ought to know. The stronger ones think they are indispensable, and they alone know what is best. The weaker ones think they are dispensable, and so they have nothing to contribute. And as an outcome, the church at Corinth, which is the body of Christ at Corinth, threatened to become a monstrosity. All year or our brain or all eye, far from being able to hear or speak, much less think. And this is the problem that we want to consider today. Just as it afflicted the church at Corinth, it may be just as much afflicting us today. In considering this issue, John Calvin says, the Corinthians abused the gifts of God for ostentation and show, show off. And love was little, if at all, regarded. They just wanted to show off. And what is the Corinthian problem then? This afternoon, I invite you to take a look in with me. You see, the Apostle Paul being aware of what is going on at the church at Corinth and the trouble that was stirring there, wrote to them this letter, 1 Corinthians, which is actually the second letter he wrote. The first one was lost. And there in this passage that we're considering this afternoon, he reminded of them, them of important principles. And the first one he mentioned is that we are one body of Christ with many members. Verse 12, for just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. Number one. Secondly, he reminded them that we are all baptized into one body of Christ <coughs> and drink of one spirit. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks or slaves or free, and we all made to drink of one spirit. That is an important principle that the Corinthian church ought to have kept in mind even as they tried to express themselves as a church. Eugene Peterson, in considering these two verses, put it in a different way in his trans, um, translation of the New Testament called the message. And it comes across very interestingly as he says, by means of his one spirit, we all said goodbye to our partial and piecemeal lives. Just like the story of the ear, the ear, the hands, the feet that you heard earlier, which I tried to project to you in as humorous a way, but I realized that it didn't quite work and very few of you laughed. <coughs> But we live piecemeal lives, partial piecemeal lives. We each used to independently call our own shots. But then, Eugene Peterson explains, we entered into a large and integrated life in which Christ 
has the final say in everything. And there Eugene Peterson put in parentheses, this is what we proclaim in word and action when we were baptized into Christ Jesus. There in his paraphrase, Eugene explains very clearly what it means. <clears throat> Thank you. I, I actually brought my own water, but this is good as well. Thank you, sister. The mic is, sorry, lower a bit. Is okay now? Any other adjustments, dear brother? Thank you. <laughs> Sister, okay, huh? <clears throat> I drank the water you gave me. <clears throat> Eugene Peterson, in fair praising those two verses, was communicating something very important. And that happened when we were baptized into Christ Jesus. Coming from our unbelieving pagan backgrounds, we were outside of Christ. But in the baptism, we went into the water, dying to ourselves, identifying with the death of Jesus. And as we rise, we identify with the rising of Jesus, becoming a new person and being incorporated spiritually into the body of Christ. We are no longer our own, but we now belong to Christ. And as we belong to Christ, we are individually members of this great spiritual body. And now we live from a different perspective, not from our own piecemeal self, but from the perspective with Christ as the head and us as the members of the body. That is the meaning of baptism. How many of you are baptized in this congregation? Can you raise your hands? You have been baptized. Do you know that that's the significance for the sacrament in which you have participated in? And we are reminded of this. But the Corinthian church may have forgotten, so Paul has to write to get them once more. And Paul's main point in this passage here is that we now belong to Christ, as must, and must learn to work together in Christ because we no longer belong to ourselves. We have been baptized into Christ Jesus. Our old life is gone. Our new life has come. We take on a different identity and so a different perspective and a different trajectory in lives. And as Paul writes to them, he states that main point clearly in the verses we just read. And then again in these subsequent verses, his main point is restated. That is just as there are many parts, yet one body. And now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And this is very important for the Corinthian church to understand. For they are a young church. And they have just been constituted just a few years ago. And they come together now from their largely pagan backgrounds. And they, but they must learn what it means to be no longer pagan, but now the body of Christ in Corinth. Just as it applied to the church in Corinth, the same applies to us. And as we hear this, we may then pause to reflect how do these insights now shape my perspective on participating in ministry as a member of the body of Christ. How do these insights on Christian baptism, on what it means now to leave the past and be incorporated into the body of Christ, shape my perspective on my participation in Christian ministry, as a member of the body of Christ. And this must continue to be the question we ask, we carry, even as we participate in church service, in church ministry, and even larger beyond the church in Christian ministry outside. But there is a problem that confronts the Christian church just as it confronted the Corinth, church at Corinth, 
is that Christians somehow do not how, know how to work together. Christians refuse to work together. If we honestly examine our track record, say, for example, going by the number of denominations around the world, it reflects that we do not know how to get along. We do not know how to get along as a global church. And sadly, often in the local church, we do not know how to get along. We spend a large amount of time in disagreement and quarrels. And we're not happy, we walk out, we form another subgroup or another church. And there are so many splinters. If anything, the worst indictment on the church today is that it doesn't know how to work together. And we've seen this to be so not only in the Christian church, but also in Christian families. And the same attitudes perpetuate across families to subgroups, to Christian groups, to Christian churches. Perhaps if I consider the question of participating in a ministry, I might consider asking this. When I begin from my own perspective, as I try to participate in ministry, what might be the outcome? I offer you this scenario, and I read it for you. See, sometimes in my effort to serve in ministry, I begin with my own perspective. Assessing what the church needs from my own gifting, instead of first considering the variety of gifts and function in the church. In other words, I begin from my point of view. And you know, from our point of view, everything is right. right? Everyone is right in their own eyes. Because I see only from my perspective, and what I choose to see and grasp is often right. But should I instead take a moment to assess how my unique contribution can complement other unique contributions so that we can serve together as a beautiful tapestry to build the church holistically in all its diversity? I invite you to consider this scenario. How we begin in ministry and how might we even persist or insist in ministry. As a starting point, only from my perspective. However, is there another alternative where I begin from a larger perspective, surveying the variety of gifts in the church and the variety of functions in the church, and then appreciating this diversity before humbling asking, where, from my own sense of giftedness, might I make a contribution that can fit in? And would my contribution build up the church as a result, rather than render it more fractious? The Apostle Paul addresses these issues, and he offers a corrective. And he has a reason corrective. This one doesn't work all the time. I have to press a few times. It's okay, point that, that, that way, huh? Okay. All right, point that way. It, it's not moving. Uh, just like the scenario I was speaking earlier. Hello, clicker, move, move backwards. Move backwards. Okay. It's the, it's the battery. It's the battery. Yeah. Now? Okay. The backwards, this one is forwards. Okay, now it's okay. All right. First, Paul's reason, uh, corrective, helps us to appreciate that the body is differentiated, but no less parts of one body. If the foot should say, he writes, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, would that, would, that would not make it any less a part of the body. 
And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. They're differentiated, and, but they, they still belong to that part. And though differentiated, they, the whole body were to, do, de, de, together, and yet they are differentiated. Sorry, I missed this point. And though they are together, yet they are differentiated. There's one body, but that they are each given a component part that is a part of that body. The whole, if the whole body were an eye for us, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were a ear, where would the sense of smell be? Yeah. As it is, they cannot understand. And there in the Corinthian church, you have an expression which Paul puts in these words, where the eyes say to hand, I have no need of you. And the head saying to the feet, like we heard earlier, I have no need of you. Now, these words may not be said by one, actually, one Corinthian church member, but it's the attitude that displays it. That they display that attitude where one consider himself or herself more important than another. And when that person who consider himself or herself more important than another, whether by word or by attitude or by action, communicates a message to another member in the church that says, you know, I don't really need you around in the church, actually. I don't want to say it, but you know, you know what I mean? You know, yeah. And this kind of attitude perpetuating in the Corinthian church. But we pause to ask, is this kind of attitude also present in our contemporary church? Is it present even in our own church here in Singapore Life Church? where we find another member kind of clumsy, you know. The feet can't walk properly. So can you imagine, says the feet saying to the hand, hand, why can't you walk properly? But the hands are not made to walk, you know. Yeah, but hands, why can't you walk properly like I do? I walk swiftly, you know, but hands, you are so clumsy when you walk. You know, why, why can't you be like me? I don't, have, I don't have need for you to walk around. I can walk on my own. You know what it means. That kind of attitude. And it perpetuated in the Corinthian church. And it continues to perpetuate in our contemporary church. We just don't say it. But in our hearts, in our minds, we think it. Say, these members are so difficult to get along. They are so cumbersome to work with. Why? Why do the Corinthian, why do some among the Corinthians despise each other? Why do they consider themselves more honorable than other members and feel they have no need for them? You see, as we mentioned earlier, the Corinthian church was a rather young church, a baby church, baby Christians. And the Gospel Coalition study says the Christians there are probably no more than three years. And they all came from a pagan background. That means they have no prior Christian experience at all. They were not bred and born in Christian families and grew up in Christian churches. They were all converts. And they got no idea what it means to become a body of Christ, a Christian church. And as a result, they continue to bring their Corinthian values into the church. And that's why they think that way. Now, what were some of the Corinthian values? Well, they value good rhetoric. If you can speak well, you are, m must be very gifted. They value wealth. They value intellect. They value a host of things that is very showy. And as a result, you found in the letters in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, Paul addressing these issues. There are about 10 issues in the first letter of Corinthians that Paul addresses in the church, where they are all carrying over from pagan Corinthian values into the church. And simply because they are young and they don't understand, and they continue to express themselves 
the way they used to now in the church. But Paul says, no, no. Do understand that you are no longer to carry yourselves the way you previously did. Because remember, you were baptized. You left the past behind and you enter into a new present in Christ. The past must go, the new must come, and you must continue in the way of the present that is defined by the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the way of love. And Paul addresses it. But right here, in this chapter 12, these verses, Paul addresses specifically the problems where they that they exhibited in terms of not wanting to work with each other. And this is what we want to look to into specifically this afternoon. What was the problem? Even as they acted like they were before as a set of pagans, now they continue with the same attitude, even though they carried a new label as a Christian. And can that happen to us? It can, if we don't understand. So let's take some time to look into what the root problem is, which is the problem really of sin. The problem of sin. Specifically, what was it? Firstly, or there are, I would like to highlight to you three sly expressions of sin. Firstly, there is egotism under the guise of giftedness. If you read the first 11 verses of this chapter, chapter 12, verse 11, you realize that the Corinthian churches, Corinthian Christians were after a lot of expression of spiritual gifts, and they felt good about it. They felt as if these are new gifts that will really give my Christian life color. I can express myself. But what they didn't realize is after a while they were after this gift and that gift, this expression of exuberance and that expression of exuberance and be caught up with the exuberance and carried away with the exuberance to the extent that they were focused only on the exuberance and how their ego can be enlarged by the expression. At the end of it, it was their ego at work rather than the spiritual gifts exercised for the benefit of the body. What's the problem there? They have failed to use their spiritual gifts to serve its proper purpose. Can the same thing happen to our church today? And the answer is, yes, of course. Because we are gifted. Some are gifted musically, some are gifted intellectually, some are gifted with their hands and feet able to fix things, some are gifted in the way they control the sound system, some are gifted in the way they cook and they can cater for a large group with little problem. Yeah. But after a while, they get carried away that, with that gift. It says, you don't cook, la. you don't know how to cook, la. you sit down, la. I cook. La. Yeah. You don't know how to sing, la. you don't sing, la. I sing. La. You don't speak la. You speak nobody here la. I speak la. Yeah. And we begin to belittle others who have a different spiritual gift from us, seeing only from our perspective and missing the point that our spiritual gift is really a gift of the Spirit to enrich the body of Christ. Now, why? Because as we mentioned earlier, the starting point is from their perspective. You see this whole congregation? There are so many of them here. They must be hungry. Therefore, I must feed them. I must cook for them. I must cook the best nasi lemak in the whole of Singapore. More from my own perspective. Yeah? Um, and that is, that, is, that is okay sometimes in expressing our spiritual gifts but when it is so reduced to that narrow perspective, it becomes a problem. What is the second problem? So this is a self-serving spirituality uh, that we concerned earlier. This, but Paul corrects them. He says, remember, the same Spirit, Lord and God, gave gifts to the body for the common good. 
and not just for, for your flamboyant expression. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for what? For the common good. Put in colloquial terms again, you may be good to sing in singing, but not everyone can sing. You may be good in cooking, but not everyone wants to eat your nasi lemak. Right? We appreciate that the body is different. That's the first problem. The second problem is that their individualism was expressed to such extremes that it was expressed in opposition to being one body. And the failure there is to understand the meaning of baptism. And as we expressed earlier, baptism is a deep theological truth, a great theological mystery expressed in that sacrament. When we go down into the waters, identifying with Christ's death, and rise for the water, from the waters, identifying with Christ's resurrection, something spiritual happened through that sacramental act. And that is that we have entered into the life in Christ. As Eugene Peterson said, when we enter into a large and integrated life in which Christ has the final say in everything. In other words, when I am baptized into a Christian church, my starting point must change. My starting point must not be what can I do for the church. Don't we all ask that question? What can I do for the church? My starting point must not be that statement. Did you say it right, Pastor Jimmy? Don't say what can I do for the church. Yes, don't say what can I do for the church. Instead, say what? How do I fit in as a member of the body of Christ? How can I fit in as a member of the church? Then I begin to see from a different perspective. I see the whole body of Christ. Then I begin to see the variations, the diversity, and the tapestry. Then I begin to recognize the places of each and every person. Then I see perhaps I can fit in there. That is the meaning of being baptized into that one body. The third problem they had is that their self-interest resists a higher rule. Their self-interest. They just want to outdo each other because that is the Corinthian spirit. I outdo you. You outdo me. And, but there's no love. In fact, as we consider in meritocrat merit meritoc <laughs> Can you help me to pronounce the word? Meritocratic. Huh? meritocratic Singapore, very competitive Singapore, where we try to outdo each other at school, at work. Do we bring the same spirit into the church and try to outdo each other in church, in Christian ministry? One Christian ministry competing to an with another, and if they don't do as well, I quietly smile and say, hey, they are not progressing as well as my ministry. Where self-interest dominates rather than the higher rule of love. They fail to live by the rule of love. And these are sly sins, slippery spirituality that captivated the church in Corinth, that pull them apart, tear them apart, rather than pull them together. And the same thing can happen to us in a contemporary church, the same issues can plague us where we allow ego to dominate rather than the purpose of spiritual gifts to build up the body. Where we allow our individualism to dominate rather than functioning as a member 
of the body of Christ, where we allow our self-interest to dominate rather than the rule of love. And this I've seen not only in churches, as we said, but in families, where family members want to do something for the family, but only from their point of view, thinking that their point of view is the best, is the most right, is the most correct way. And they go about it. And when it leads to friction, they just complain that the other family members don't appreciate. The same things happen in the Corinthian church, same thing happens in the contemporary church, the same things happen in the contemporary families. When then will we learn? When then will we learn to live according to the gospel? Paul addresses it in chapter 12. And as he does, he points them forward to another way, a more excellent way in chapter 13. There in the last verse of chapter 12, he points them, says, I will show you a more excellent way. And we can't consider it this afternoon in this sermon, for this sermon is focused on the problem of the inability to appreciate the body of Christ and hence appreciate the diversity of the body and the appropriateness of our fitting contribution. And when we continue to disappreciate, can't appreciate, we end up like the beginning comic that I attempted to portray to you. The brain says, you all are so stupid, I shut everybody down, leaving only the brain. No body to function. Let's reflect for a moment. I take a moment to examine how I relate to others in my church. I examine my heart's attitude and my unspoken opinion of others. I search deep within and ask, what is causing me to relate in sinful ways rather than the way of love? Do I start only from my own perspective? Do I assume that what I can offer is always the best for the body of Christ? Or do I quietly estimate others, worse, underestimate others, and feel that they actually got nothing to contribute. These are deep-rooted sinful attitudes that continue to plague the contemporary church and family. And as a result, we do not know how to work together. We can't live together. And as a result, we lose the witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, we must think about these things. As I participate in life and ministry at Singapore Life Church or elsewhere, do I consider myself more honourable than other members of the body or my ministry more honourable than another? What if I continue in my limited perspective and insist to serve only in the way I think best? What repercussions might this attitude have on the church, the body of Christ? These are questions I leave with you to have you consider, and if you like, I can send them to you through your church uh, pastor or administrator as a study guide, and I have it ready for you. But as I bring the sermon to the cl as a close, we might ask then, what is God's wise corrective? What is the corrective then? I want to offer you this verse. As each part does its work, as Paul, as Paul writes in another letter to the church at Ephesus, he says, Rather, speaking the truth in love, we may grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. That's in the ESV. 
The NIV puts 16 this way, from him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love, as each part does its work, as each part does its work. A few weeks ago, I was bitten by an ant while I was at Upper Pierce Reservoir. I was sitting there, not realizing that a big ant has crawled onto my feet. And then I felt something and I swept it away, not realizing still that the ant has bitten me. And of course, it caused a swell. And it was so much venom that it took about a few weeks to get it cured. And even now, it left a mark there. But that little bite, so to speak, can leave my body uncomfortable for several weeks. And we say, hey, that's just a bite. That's there on my insignificant part of my leg. Or is it? Or is it? No, that insignificant part of my leg affected my whole body. And likewise for us spiritually, as a body of Christ, when one part hurts, another suffers with it. When one part is set down in a way that is overwhelming, the whole body suffers with it. So we want to pay attention to each and every part, appreciating that some are stronger, some are weaker, some are more expressive, some are less expressive, some are more musical, some are less musical, some are more intellectual, some are more hands-on, some are more... Um, uh, approachable, warm, some are more reserved. It's just a variety of personalities and temperaments here for us to consider and not expect everyone to be the same. Let me just close with this two or three slides. Can you play this slide for us? Is this a picture of every part doing its work? Should this picture represent the church is my question to you. Can you play this clip? Any sound? I took it just last Saturday. Can you tell what it is? Huh? Dragon boat, right? That's the national team pulling, by the way. Is this ought to be the picture of the church? Ought to be the picture? Everyone pulling? Everyone counts? Okay. So yes and no. Why yes? You say, yeah, everyone is pulling. But no, not everyone has the same strength in a team like the members of this Dragon Boat race. The church is less like that because we are all different. You see, the Dragon Boat races, everyone is almost having the same power. We must pull together the same stroke. Everyone must have the same stroke. But you don't find it in the church, dear brothers and sisters. Not everyone has the same power in the church. Not everyone has the same stroke. Not everyone is able to pull the same way as you pull. We must understand this and make space for those who ball up, Leo, don't know how to pull. Make space for those who are afraid of water, won't even get into the dragon boat. Make space for those who have no arms, cannot pull. Maybe the picture ought to be this instead. Five generations working side by side. Where they are young, not so young, not so old, old older. I couldn't find a more suitable picture, but I thought, hey, this one represents the diversity in the church where the young perhaps are very strong and the old are very not so strong now. I'm 62 this year and I realized that I've changed. You know, I still live in the masonette, but the stairs are posing a challenge for me. So I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm looking around to downsize or the right size where I don't have to climb stairs so much every day. Um, and that's where we, what I'm saying is that we appreciate each other's special needs. each other's face of life, each other's temperament, 
each other's personality. And then we try to work in a way that will fit in properly. For the old, we slow down. For the young, they want to walk faster. Okay, give them the space to walk. For those who are more exuberant, we try to walk. Okay. For those who want to talk, don't force them to talk. You know? We learn to fit in together. And we learn to function as a family. I was looking at this picture too. And this, of course, is a picture of a hospital. And you see the different roles and different parts that must come in together in order to treat one patient. And I recently, of course, last year, we tended to our mom when she was gravely ill. And just one mother who is ill, I spoke to 11 different professionals on one case because they have diff, you know, you understand what I mean? You speak to the doctor, the nurses, the dietitian, the phys physiotherapist, the clinician. We spoke to just on one. And, and then just to update the family on all this and did it over a period of several weeks. It was very tiring. But my point here is that this looks more like the church and we must remember that this is the church. My time is up. I'll close with three principles then. If the Corinthian church problem was that they think that their individual gifts was the starting point, then what ought to be our starting point? If they think that their assumptions, that their spiritual gifts it will make a difference, then what ought to be our consideration? If they think that only the fittest matters in the church, then what ought to be our attitude today? I want to propose to you three principles as I bring the sermon to a close. The first is see rightly. Begin with the big picture. And this big picture especially takes into consideration eternity. It is not just here and now. It is not just in these 80, 90 years. There are many more years beyond our life that God is still at work. Begin with the big picture. Try to grasp the church from a different perspective. Second, remain humble. Explore how my peace fits in. Don't assume that it will fit in. Explore where perhaps can I fit in. And how might I fit in? How will it make a difference? Then explore how the pieces come together. These three principles I propose can make a huge difference to how we live together as a family, as a church, and as a global Christian organization, a global Christian church. May the Lord help us. Let us pause to pray. Dear God, men's words are indeed limited, but your word will never return to you void. I pray that you will take all that is shared this afternoon and help us to mull over it. We pray this through the help of your indwelling spirit. Amen.